Hey, everybody, come on in and listen to part two with Cassie Christopher as we are talking about how to build self-compassionate new habits around eating and what are the top two habits you're going to need to know so that you can change your relationship with food without increasing your shame. See you inside. Welcome everybody to the CPTSD podcast. This is season four, episode seven. I am Tabitha Bird Weaver, your host. Um, I am a trauma therapist and always hoping to bring you information on this podcast that will help you figure out anything you need to know about CPTSD and who you really are. So today we're doing part two with Cassie Christopher. She is going to be talking with us about the four pillars that you need to know about um, in order to take good care of yourself. And, you know, I think we're just going to traipse along and talk a little bit more about food, your relationship with yourself, and some of the most important self-care habits that you can come up with today. So Cassie, thank you for being willing to do part two here. Um, In review of our last conversation, we were really talking about how food issues come from wounding that we have from our culture, high control environments, our families, lots of places that we get wounding. And the, the primary wound that really you were talking about is shame. And how that really, really orients us to being self-critical. And I loved your tip at the end of our last discussion, which was to be aware of those criticisms and then come into yourself, hold a place in your body that feels good and ask, may I be kind? So let's start that just right now. Everybody in the audience, tune into yourself and wonder today if you can be kind and listen to this information with kindness about you. So Cassie, let's dive right in. What are the four pillars of taking good care of yourself? Oh, I'm so excited to share this with you. So one of the the things that I want to share is where this came from. And I shared my story in in part one and, and how I would bridge the gap to what we're talking about now is I became a registered dietitian. I was doing this work in therapy and I was working with women who were struggling with emotional and binge eating. And what I saw as I witnessed them was their belovedness and their goodness, despite all the shame that they were carrying. And a light bulb went on. And I realized the same is true for me, that I am beloved and I I am good, even in the midst of all of this. And through this trial and error and experimentation, um, you know, on some respects, but let me say, I am also a master's trained registered dietitian. So there's some evidence-based theory going into this as well. Sometimes I get very deep into my my emotions and forget that piece. Um, But all of that, I I discovered what these women needed and what I needed. And, And that was first to calm the nervous system. The first pillar of this take good care model is to calm your nervous system because when you are dysregulated, anxious, panic, whatever it may be, um, your brain, you know, is not able to access that logic and, you know, maybe caring piece of yourself. And I really love Dan Siegel's window of tolerance model for this, which um, to me explains a lot of behavior we see when it comes to food, that when you are outside your window of tolerance, and those of us who've experienced trauma are maybe more likely to go outside our window of tolerance, or we are more likely to get stuck there because our our nervous systems, that's just a quick place that, that, that our nervous systems can take us. Outside our window of tolerance is where this binging, emotional eating, um, you know, overeating may happen, but it's also where restriction happens. So that, that the flip side that we think, oh, I know how to how to solve for this is I'm going to, you know, not eat anything or cut out this food group or go on this diet. And so you know, that that extreme control is not a healthy response either. And that's important to recognize. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to recognize that in order for you to get back to making sustainable, healthy choices that you feel good about, you have to get back inside your window of tolerance first. 
And that involves calming the nervous system. So that's step one. Step two, the second pillar of the take good care method is self-compassion. And I teased this one for you all in part one with if may I be kind and recognizing that self-compassion helps to heal shame. I also see self-compassion opens your eyes to this fact that your wounding and your struggles are not your fault. Because I think so often we have this, this, you know, this work ethic, this pull your up self up by your bootstraps and fix your problem. And we forget what, you know, the World Health Organization calls, calls the social determinants of health, that there is so much more at play in each of our individual choices, you know, aces aside, right? Um, as we talked about in, in part one. So being kind to ourselves, accepting, I would define self-compassion as accepting who we are and, and what we're struggling with and what we're, you know, good at or not struggling with, um, with equanimity and love and compassion, and then practicing kindness towards ourselves in the midst of that. And, and, you know, mindfulness with, with our feelings, like there's a lot to self-compassion, but it, it starts with, may I be kind. Mm -hmm. And then the third pillar of the take good care model is listening to yourself. And you may have heard this called attunement or embodiment or reconnecting with your desire. Um, I like just plain old listening to yourself, whether that be your body and what your body needs, your, your, your heart and what you want for yourself, right? right? Because a lot of our wounding is these, these external motivations, you know, here's what you should do. And we all know that should is that red flag um, of, of self-talk that shows we're kind of going down a, a destructive path. And so when we can listen to ourselves, what is it that I really want? But we can only do that once we're calm, and once we're kind, then it opens the door to be able to actually hear from ourselves what Glennon Doyle calls the knowing. And what I'll, I'll put a brief plug in, and we talked about this last time for this craving busting audio guide that if you're struggling with food cravings, this is a 10 minute you know, meditation essentially you can listen to when you're feeling those cravings. And the reason it works is because it calms your nervous system and it it kind of forces you to be nice to yourself in the middle of a craving where you might not be inclined to be kind to yourself. And so it opens the door for calmness and kindness so that when it's done, you might have more insight about, oh, you know what? It's not about the food. It's about I'm having a whole bunch of anxiety for some reason. Why is that? What's going on? You can start to listen once you're calm and once you're kind. And so by listening to yourself, again, that that third pillar um, you can understand what you actually want. You know, you have this intrinsic internal motivation instead of external and what other people want for you. And you can practice behavior change for your health. So this might be where you can start to set boundaries where you realize, you know, cake for dinner messes up with your sleep. And it's not from feeling ashamed of eating cake for dinner because who cares? Um, it's, it comes from the recognition that that isn't your, that's not best for you. And you want to sleep good and you want to care for yourself because good sleep calms your nervous system and keeps the cycle, you know, kind of an upward spiral. And so then you can start to actually practice. And this is like, lifestyle medicine, the fourth pillar, you can practice some changes that set you up to feel good in your body, to take care of your body and to take good care of your mind. You can really learn the self-care pieces that, you know, some of us with um, CPTSD maybe have never learned or we were never saw it modeled and we don't understand what does it mean to take care of ourselves? Well, you can actually start to do it once these other pieces are in place. That sounds like a structure that makes sense. And also, I love that you keep using the word practice because every one of the things that you named out, I can see why it works because it is the counter indication of what CPTSD is, right? Learning that we count, learning that our opinions matter, learning that it's okay to be you. Oh my gosh, it's okay to be me. That's nuts, right? And has been dangerous for a lot of us. 
So I really am loving that you're coming into this whole approach with mindfulness, but also the idea of skills building and self-compassion. It's really lovely, Cassie. I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. And and that's why I think it works. You know, I, I was having a conversation with a doctor the other day who said something about, well, you know, binge, when people with binge eating come in, it's just so sad because <clears throat> they, nothing can be done. And I said, that's not true. I help people with binge eating, you know, decrease, stop, whatever word you want to use, they're binge eating all the time because it's not about, right, the food. <laughs> food is really the last thing. It's the top of this pyramid. Um, we have to set the, uh, the, the, the conditions to be right so that the behavior of eating can, can kind of easily fall by the wayside. Um, and it's exciting that once we really are caring for ourselves, um, and, and seeing ourselves with kindness and goodness and gladness that, um, I believe really we're unstoppable. You know, you talked about whose voice is that and, and, um, you know, who wants, who benefits essentially from you being this way, feeling this way, staying stuck. And so, you know, I think the opposite is true when we're unstuck and we're moving towards what we care about in the world. Wow. If we can create a whole group, a community of people doing this, um, watch out oppressors. Uh, I think it's really exciting. Me too. I do too. And one of the questions I have for you, and probably our last question with time, is a lot of us with CPTSD were not educated by our family of origin about how to take care of ourselves. That's why we're having this conversation, Cassie, as you know, right? So where would we even start? What are some of the most important habits that you would recommend people tune into and pay attention to? Yeah. So I've got two for you and you can choose your own adventure and I'll I'll share what they are and then why, and then some practical strategies. Uh, The first being sleep. So Mm. sleep is so critical for calming your nervous system. Uh, And, you know, sleep really impacts your food choices. There was a 2016 meta-analysis that showed for every hour of sleep that someone was deprived, they ate an additional 385 calories. That's a candy bar. Yes. (laughs) It had nothing to do with their choice or their self-control or whatever, right? It had to do with the amount of sleep that they got. And more recently, a 2021 study, they they gave people back sleep. And I, I don't know how that wasn't what the study was about, but they took people who were sleeping less than six hours and got them sleeping like six and a half to seven hours a night and found that they naturally consumed 277 calories less without even trying. Okay. So if you're concerned about your intake, sleep may be the kind of easiest way to change that. Now, sleep, when you have a nervous system disorder, is not necessarily an easy thing to solve. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this, and and you referenced in part one, a blog post I did recently at cassiechristopher.net forward slash blog, the practical tools and recommendations I make to my clients, including the supplements that I will recommend to them that make a really big difference with sleep. And so, you know, this may be a place to look if you're someone who's like, yeah, my doctor's been telling me to go get, you know, the sleep apnea evaluation, or I know this is important, but I've been putting it off. Maybe today is that nudge. Okay. Yes. You know, go deal with the sleep because not only is it going to help your mood, it's going to help, you know, your, your choices with food. It's, it's a game changer. Sleep is. So that's one thing you can do. And that really hits at that calming the nervous system piece. I'm going to pop, I'm just going to pop in real quick, Cassie, real quick and say, yes, please. And not only will it help you with your uh, reduction by 277 calories per day, right? (laughs) But it will really benefit your mental health too. That executive functioning goes offline when we're tired. And do you know that missing an hour of sleep is the same as having a drink? That is how much it fogs up your mind. So please, step two. I just wanted to get in there and concur real quick. Like, yes, sleep's crucial. What's the second? 
Awesome. Yes. So the second piece is, um, it is a little bit more traditional nutrition stuff. Although I, like I mentioned, I work with my clients on sleep all the time because it's, it's that important. I, one way that we can calm our nervous systems with food is to keep our blood sugar stable because when blood sugar spikes up high or goes down low, we get uh, anxiety. We get an in, we get an influx of the stress hormone cortisol. So what we can do then to keep that stable is to eat protein and fiber regularly. So when I work with people, a lot of times what I'm seeing is they just don't eat during the day or they think breakfast and eating breakfast is bad because right now fasting is, you know, the big thing, whatever. Right. Or they're just not hungry in the morning. And, you know, I kind of think that that's probably conditioning rather than maybe what their body naturally needs. And so when we add in like a really great breakfast or a nice snack in the middle of the day so that we're eating regularly throughout the day, making sure that someone's getting protein, making sure that someone's getting fiber, um, Their blood sugar is stable. And I would say, you know, 75% of the time that decreases nighttime eating in particular very dramatically because their needs are being met during the day. So they don't have all this extra hunger at night. And so a really simple self-care strategy. I mean, it's, it's obviously easier said than done because this involves going to the grocery store or ordering groceries and making sure you have stuff on hand and then taking time out of the day to actually eat. Like I understand it's not necessarily easy to enact, but but much simpler to say um, is to eat regularly throughout the day. And that that um, can, again, calm, keep you calm. It's really good for calming the nervous system so that your brain has more space and capacity to practice the self-compassion and listening to yourself and these other things that we've been talking about. Brilliant. And um, it does take planning, but uh, I think that I am just going to concur. I upped my fiber intentionally uh, three years ago and it changed my life. Not to be true dramatic, but it it really did. Um, So Cassie, I'm wondering as we're coming to the close of part two, do you have any other last minute thoughts or tips that you would like to offer people before we say goodbye? I, the last thought that I'll give is a point of view of experimentation. One thing that often happens with nutrition in particular is we're so used to these diets where we overhaul everything and have to learn a whole new way of eating. And I can only eat, you know, three snap peas or whatever, right? And, and so we think like, okay, well, this is the way I'm eating for the rest of my life now. Like for an example of this, I was working with a client who said, I was getting the protein shake you recommended because for her, that was going to be an easy way to get her protein in. And I was in line asking myself, am I going to be able to afford this when I'm, you know, 80 years old and on social security? And, you know, she was kind of laughing at herself, but I think that's a good example that we think, oh, well, If I'm trying this now, it's the way it will always be. Well, we all know that's not true. That's very black and white. It's very all or nothing. So instead, I present to you this idea of experiments. Go get the Craving Busting audio guide at CassieChristopher.net and commit to trying it once, you know, as an experiment. Maybe sleep, experiment with that. Protein fiber, eating regular, experiment. Pick one thing and let it be an experiment that you are curious and, you know, joyfully engaging in rather than like, oh, this thing now that I do and it's going to be so hard. You know, we can come at it with lightness and playfulness and it, it feels so so much better and I believe more sustainable with, with that attitude. Yeah. Playfulness can add years to your life. I'm, I'm convinced of it. Cassie, I just want to offer a tip and, and if you have a response to what I'm going to say, I would love to hear it because I'm always open to, uh, you know, input. Um, if you are out there and you're going to try some of these ideas that we're presenting to you, first of all, congratulations. And I don't know about you, Cassie, but I'm so proud of you for even thinking about this stuff. If you are in the process of noticing those critical thoughts that we've been talking about and you want the cake for dinner, but you remember Cassie saying that's going to mess up your blood sugar at night and all of that's going through your head, 
you can still eat the cake. And if you choose to do that, I would encourage you to make it an empowered choice. Like, yeah, I know that it's not what everybody's telling me to do, but I'm going to eat this cake. And when you do that, taste the cake, feel the cake, smell the cake, experience the cake, be with the cake. Because two things, first of all, you're going to get saturated with your senses and that is regulating. Food is regulating to our body as we've been talking about here. But also, it can really help you reduce the shame load of having eaten that cake because you decided that it was a decision, and then you experience the cake instead of dissociating and just shoving it down, right? So I would encourage you to think about it that way, that if you're going to embrace that thing that you, and I'm air quoting in case you're just listening, should stop doing, then fully embrace it mindfully. Cassie, thank you Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate it. Please head over to CassieChristopher.net and check out all of her information and resources. It is really friendly to being compassionate to yourself, and that's crucial. So until next time, um, we will, I hope, eat well and be healthy, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Bye, everybody. 